New York. Today, 8.2 million people live in this remarkable city. Over the last 100 years, a child has been born here, on average, every four and a half minutes. What sort of a place have they arrived in? Yes, first light, New York City. Over the next 24 hours, I intend to explore this town. I want to meet its people, experience some of its astonishing culture and diversity, and try to understand what really makes New York, New York. It's utterly crucial to the life of this town that Manhattan is an island. It's suspended between the Atlantic and the American continent. It's estimated that 50% of everything that ever entered the United States of America has come through this gateway, through this port. That includes goods, but it also includes people. And this is the view, which except, of course, for the modern skyscrapers once greeted the greatest migration in human history. Having landed here, they became one nation under God. More than 15 million flags are made in the US every year. Early each morning, it's Adam Hett's job to start at the southern tip of Manhattan and hoist old glory across the city. OK, we got him perfect. It's heavier than it looks. Yeah, yeah, I know that. <laughs> How many flags are you responsible for, Adam? Oh, but close to 73, 74. 73 or 4 flags? From here to 14th Street. Adam, what's happening for me now? Everywhere I look, I see flags. <laughs> see, look, there's another flag over there. New York has the most ethnically diverse population on the planet. There are more than 170 languages spoken in these six boroughs. Where are you from originally? I have no country now. All of the pieces. <laughs> <laughs> but where are you from? What's used, it? Used to be Yugoslavia. Now Yugoslavia? It's, now it's six countries. <laughs> <laughs> I come to this country a long time ago. I, so I you're a native New Yorker now? Yeah, New yeah. Yorker, yeah. <laughs> Legend has it that in 1626, the entire island of Manhattan was bought by a Dutchman from a group of Native Americans for the equivalent of just $24. Well, given that the place is now worth trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions, it was seen as a rather a poor deal. But in fact, those Native Americans didn't actually own the island. The truth is, they were just passing through. And I think they rather enshrined the spirit of New York which is to make a quick buck out of absolutely anything. Hey, baby, jump over here when you do the ooby-dooby. I'm trying to be near ooby-dooby. Over the river in Brooklyn, a family of Greek immigrants runs a thriving business, serving the very best of New York breakfasts. What can I get you? Let me go with a corned beef hash with at 8 a.m., no time of day is busier for the staff here at Tom's Diner. Let me also get a chocolate egg cream. Chocolate egg cream. Sorry. Uh, Lawrence, can I give you an order? Corn beef hash, two eggs. This huge range of things that people like that. French right. toast. They have a French lot toast. of options. They have Belgian waffles, they have yeah. French toast, they have pancakes of all kinds. Yeah. But here we have them, they're thicker. You put a little bit more on top. Exactly. You put some fruit on it. Uh, we you put, put some fruit, sugar on it. A lot of maple syrup. A lot of maple like syrup. Like that. Everything is derivative to make you happy, yeah. but not thin. That's a, that's a waffle going through, isn't it? Yeah. Belgian waffles, French toasts, English muffins, they all sound like immigrants. But they are, of course, utterly American. 
Somewhere in my client's gargantuan breakfast order, I've managed to forget his most bizarre request. Get excited. There you go. Chocolate syrup on top of that. There you go. Hi, guys. You're hired. And there's the chocolate. Thank you so much. <laughs> the quantity of different things that are available. It's a feat of memory to rival a British taxi driver learning the knowledge to learn all the extremes of carbohydrate, fat, and sugar that an American in New York can eat for breakfast. <laughs> On the streets of Manhattan, the morning rush hour is reaching its fevered peak. But at Grand Central Terminal, it feels more like a stately dance. Dan Brooker, like me, loves this place. He takes me high above the main concourse. Built by America's wealthiest family, the Vanderbilts, this place is more like a temple than a terminal. What an extraordinary view. And passing through this main concourse every day are seven hundred thousand people to give you an idea that's the entire population of san francisco comes walking through here every day and what's amazing is none of them bump into each other they're all moving at a rapid pace and they're not even brushing shoulders that's why it's like a city in itself because a city is an opportunity for human beings to live in such close proximity to each other and go on with their own jobs and get on with their own life without bumping into each other. Yes. It's, one of the, it's one of the great marvels. We don't think of it like that. We don't yeah. realize how extraordinary that is. But that is the marvel of a city. And here it is. Here is a way of seeing it. It's so quiet. It doesn't even feel like a railway station. All the paraphernalia is sort of hidden away down tunnels. And you get this echoing stillness and above you the heavens although a few days after it was opened an amateur astronomer pointed out to Vanderbilt that all the constellations are back to front they've been put up the wrong way around and they investigated and found that the painter had got it all wrong he'd had his picture upside down so the line taken was that it was meant to be like this, that you were looking at the sky, not as a human being, but as if you were a god. I had another surprise in store as Dan led me below the main concourse. But you may notice something interesting down here. Look, why are these people facing into corners like that? We are literally in the middle of a secret right here. Here's why. You're going to get into one corner okay. over there, and I'm going to get together. You're going to All face right. dead in. Right. Dead if you ever want to have a private word in this city, this is the place to come right. to whisper sweet and nothings. Apparently, it's one of New York's favorite places to propose. Now, Griff, do you know what people think that you're doing right now? I can guess. I've just looked over at you and thought <laughs> that people might be thinking I'm making use of a facility, which we're, we're <laughs> only using a, a whispering facility. <laughs> Dan, you're attracting attention there. Oh, well, yeah, there no Dan tried his best. Unfortunately, I was already spoken for. During a lifetime, the average New Yorker throws away more than 600 times their own body weight. And with 8.2 million citizens, that's a lot of trash. San Solo. Clearing the streets Carmelo. of the city Good is the job goodness. of New York's sanitation Washington. department. Filet. It's a highly organized Lee operation Johnson. run along Here. paramilitary lines. Mejia. Here. Jones. Here. I'm joining the ranks of celebrity. Both Boy George and the fragrant Naomi Campbell before me have done time with the Department of Sanitation, though perhaps not as willingly. I'm going with Rob and Cyrus to clear five blocks on Manhattan's Upper West Side. There's some the dog yeah, is best on this. Oh, that's the best too. <laughs> <laughs> you're just going to throw it in this carpet? Here, would you like to buy it? You get on this job, a certain satisfaction about seeing it cleared, isn't it? I remember being a little kid. You know, yeah. When you see the big truck, you're like, whoa, I can't wait to be a garbage man. Now, here I am. And I'm like, whoa, this is relentless. I'm not even doing it for about five minutes. <laughs> you see your muscles now. Yeah. I now get why this city's garbage collectors are affectionately known as New York's strongest. Every day, they clear 50,000 
Straight in there, baby. Straight in. Yes, okay. Sir. Okay, I got it. I got it. Okay. There we go. That lavatory bowl is beginning a long journey. It'll be transported by barge to New Jersey, crushed and compacted, and then loaded onto a train. It will travel an astonishing 300 miles to be buried in a massive landfill site in West Virginia. New York has always thought big. My own admiration for the Department of Sanitation is actually shared by the city itself. New York has an avenue to celebrate its firefighters, a street for its police force, and it must be the only city in the world to pay homage to its dustbin men. They told me I could see New York in all its spreading strength and power from the city's highest spot on top of the famous Woolworth Tower. The Woolworth Tower! Oh, Woolworth Tower. Beat me, Daddy! Did you say the Woolworth Tower? I won't beat you, but I said the Woolworth Tower! I'm not really supposed to be in here because this is still very much a private skyscraper. This is the Woolworth Building, built by Frank W. Woolworth, paid for in cash to be the tallest building in the world in 1913. He wanted it at least to be taller than the Metropolitan Life Insurance Building because they'd once refused him a mortgage. And the reason it looks like a dowager's handbag is not because the place was built out of necessity, but because he wanted to show off. Woolworth wanted to have a bigger erection than any other tycoon in town. And just for a while, he did. Manhattan shot up. The city became the vertical metropolis we know today in a very few years indeed. It was not simply lack of space. High rise was driven by high rents, towering ambitions, and most of all, enormous egos. By 1929, two architects, William Van Allen and H. Craig Severance, had become locked in a battle to construct the tallest building in the world. The trouble is, they used to be partners, and now they're rivals. So, every time William Van Allen publishes plans for this building, the Chrysler building, his rival proposes to go higher, and they go up and up and up, and each going higher and higher, and finally, the peer of the Chrysler Building, they give up. They say, OK, have it, go ahead, build. So they end up with the tallest building in the world down there on Wall Street, well, only for a few days, because, in fact, William H. Allen has hidden away 185 foot of silvery spire in his attic. And as he comes to the completion, he pulls it out, pops it up, and instantly becomes the tallest and most beautiful car showroom the world has ever seen. But actually, only for a year or two, because then along comes the Empire State Building. New York has 4,493 skyscrapers, here, more than any other city in the world. But there's still one that stands out amongst the giants. The Empire State Building is 103 stories high. It was constructed in the 1930s during the depths of the American Depression. Its steel frame shot up at an astonishing four stories a week. That, that is very, very perpendicular. I don't suffer at all from vertigo, but every now and again you look over, and every now and again a little wave of imagination comes over you, and you just have to grip on, just to reassure yourself that that's solid. I find myself, as I walk down the canyons of New York, and you look up and you think, What's it all for? Who's up there? What are they using all that space to do? Because these buildings seem to dwarf human beings. It's no wonder that this is the city that had to invent Superman and Batman. All that glass. How many barrels of windoline does that require, I wonder? We're about 30 stories up right. in the air. View of the United Nations, Chrysler Building. Lovely. And uh, below us, 30 stories of glass. You've got to clean. Okay. And how many... Uh, we... My instructor, Brent, seems remarkably confident in my ability, given that I am a complete novice work experience Spider-Man. Don't hit the window too hard. 
No. Because we're cleaning them, not breaking them. Brent himself has no fear of heights at all and puts this down to his Native American roots. He tells me that his Cheyenne name translates as him that walks on ledges. Apparently, his Indian spirit has always looked after him. As for me, I come from Cardiff, where spirits are things you find in pubs. It was time to find out who would watch over me. I want to give you my lucky hat. It'll keep you safe. Brent? You got it. <laughs> I want all this to keep me safe, but I'll wear the hat. With 30 stories beneath me, Brent and his Ecuadorian assistant, Vincent, momentarily pause to consider how their safety equipment works. Hold right here. You can let go of this. You're yeah. okay. You're perfect. You're okay. I just you, don't feel very secure. Now, put your finger right here and play. Play. Play with this. You see? You see? I'd have liked a little less unstructured debate and a little more confident instruction. There are two figures like this. Yeah. What I can't fine. understand, You're I just good. need to play okay. with it. Now your left hand, your I right just need hand. to get used to playing with this. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Okay. You go so fast, you stop. Rather than Brent's lucky hat, I felt in need of a new pair of trousers. Open, open your legs, open. And go down, go down, easy. I can't go on the, both on the foot. I have to put one on the, on the glass. No, 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 put pressure on the glass. Go, go down, go down. OK, what? Vincent, how long have you been doing this job? I do it like almost 13 years. 30 years? Yeah. How many years you got left? <laughs> I got it like maybe 25. 25 <laughs> years, I hope so. I hope so. Okay. I tell you, do you know how long I'm going to do this job for? Mm. <laughs> I'm going to do it for about 10 minutes. <laughs> This lovely morning has now provided me with the single most terrifying experience of my life. And I'm in need of a bit of a lie down. I can trust New York to cater for all my requirements. In my private booth, my heart rate slows to normal and for $15, I buy exactly 20 minutes of high-quality catnap. New Yorkers do like to be the first in absolutely everything. And this here was the site of the very first road accident. Miss Evelyn Thomas was pedalling her bike down Broadway when she was mowed down by Mr. Henry Wells in his Derea motor machine. And the New York Times was outraged. It said these things are a danger to a life and limb, particularly to people on horses. But uh, luckily, Miss Evelyn survived, although the very first auto fatality actually took place about 200 yards up that way. At least it looks like I'm going to make it to my appointment for lunch at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Thank you. That's my $2 hot dog. But what do you think that cart pays in rental to the city? Well, I'll tell you. That cart pays $300,000 a year for that spot. And for some reason, the cart at the other end is an extra $25,000 a year. Either way, space is expensive in New York City. Hmm. Now I can see where the profit is. For the past 60 years, celebrities have found their own space at the Carlisle Hotel. James McBride, the Carlisle's managing director, showed me a suite overlooking Central Park, where the bed was still warm, 
because George Clooney had just checked out. This is the view yes. of some of the, the richest and most successful people in the world. Indeed. And Jamie, you actually have people who live in the hotel. Yeah, we do have quite a few people that own apartments. I think living at the Carlisle is a, a little bit like owning a plane or having a boat. It's one of the things you have to know that you can afford it's before a, you do it. You have to know that you can afford it. Yeah. It's a, it's a very special place to live. Uh, but if you just wanted, if I wanted to come and stay here... Yes. Know, if I wanted to, you know, to have the suite for the night, yes. how, how much would that cost me? It would cost you $7,000. 3500 in your money. Cheap. Is that, is that a, a week? <laughs> Wherever you go in New York, you can't fail to notice the iron fire escapes. But a few blocks north of the Carlisle, right on Central Park, and bang in the middle of some of the most desirable property in the city, there happens to be a large, prominent building with no fire escape at all. That's for a good reason. It's a prison. I've come to meet the governor, or as he's known here, the superintendent. Lieutenant Williams, Mr. Jones, please. Hey, Mr. Jones. Hi. Nice to meet you. It's been a while. My arrival coincided with the draft of new prisoners from a high security prison upstate. The Lincoln Correctional Facility is where these prisoners will serve out the final years of their sentences. Gentlemen, all the bags have to come in before the next door opens. Last year, seven million people were either in American jails or passing through the US probation and parole services. Which That's means that one in every 100 in. adult Americans is currently Bandit incarcerated. Yet in New York, the figures for murder and violent crime are at their lowest for 45 years. All right, you can move. Espinosa, step up. It's an all-male prison, but the warders seem to be all women. We do have a majority of women here in a male facility, but it's, it's really not an issue. We have some pretty tough women, so... <laughs> one blanket, one pillowcase, one towel. An inmate rule book. If you're a person with consistency, whether male or female, they can respect that. They learn to respect that and they learn to understand. They might try a female a little bit, you know, because they feel they're males. Yeah. You know, a little macho. They can push you around a bit. If they find a woman that's going to stand up for you know, and, and not take it, then they know where you're coming from. And they can form. Step this way. To your right. You are William, nine top. This bed right here that's open. And Espinosa. In the dormitory, top, the I was very aware of another yeah. view of Central Park that I'd just seen. It was a few blocks south. It wasn't through an iron grill, but it was an almost identical outlook. They called that a penthouse suite, and you paid a lot of money to get hold of it. Here at Lincoln, their program is designed to help prisoners adapt back to life outside. Superintendent Williams explained how the prisoners are let out to find jobs in the city. The atmosphere is the first thing that starts to give them this sense, OK, wait a minute, you they really trust me not to, uh, you know, break out of the prison, that kind of thing? Or, they're going to let me they, out yeah, for a day. They're going to really let me out, that kind of thing, you know? <laughs> and expect me to come back and come back, back exactly. So it begins at a gradual process where, you know, we let them out for one day, then the next week we let them out for two days, and the next day three days, you know? And when they come back, there are counselors here to talk to them, well, how did it go? So the more they realize that we're not here to hurt them, but to help them, that responsibility starts to build up. Are you a fan of New York after all this time? Am I a fan of New York? Yeah. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I think I'm the luckiest correctional superintendent. I think my officers are the luckiest correctional officers. And I think my inmates are the luckiest inmates to be able to have this view and, and, and go out there, you know, already with a very positive atmosphere facing them, you know. And how could you go wrong? Released from the Lincoln Correctional Facility, I was free to make my way out and into the great green space of the city, Central Park. 
this vast resource in the middle of Manhattan was actually an afterthought in the history of New York. And 150 years ago, it wasn't an entirely popular idea. It wasn't the landscaping, though more gunpowder was used to clear the ground than was later fired at the Battle of Gettysburg. It wasn't the three million cubic yards of soil or the 270,000 plants that had to be imported. It was the fact that 16,000 residents had to be moved out of the way to make the place. Today, 25 million people use it every year. That's an awful lot of New Yorkers looking for a place to park their asses. Fortunately, if all the benches in Central Park were put end to end, they'd make one bench, seven miles long. New Yorkers love a good parade. You name the occasion, and they'll march up and down for you. <laughs> Two old ladies trying to cross the road back there. What is this? It's a parade, my dear. Well, I can see it's a parade. It's a tartan parade. Tartan parade? Yes. Is that Scotland? Yes. I just want to cross the road. But crossing the road takes me further than Scotland. <laughs> When I think of New York, I think of it at odds with Islam. But with more than 300,000 Muslims in the city, the world's fastest growing religion is actually flourishing here. I think just about every nation and every culture is represented in New York City. I call New York City immigrants paradise because you can be here, make a living, and still keep, keep, keep in touch with your culture no matter where you're from. Do you think New York has uh, been, become a less tolerant place after 9-11? No, um, I, I don't think so. Proof of that actually happened uh, a couple of months after. I remember so clearly that in the middle of Fifth Avenue, this woman, she was Muslim, and she was selling pictures of the towers being hit. Now, if the towers were in Istanbul, OK, and Istanbul suffered that, uh, that, that terrible, terrible uh, tragedy, if that woman was doing it in the middle of Istanbul, she probably would have been beaten to death. Nobody did anything to her. They might have not approved what she was doing, but she wasn't. Uh, killed or she wasn't hit or she wasn't harassed in any way. And that proves how tolerant New Yorkers are to me. Nevertheless, the scars of 9-11 run deep. Erhan, my taxi driver, reminded me that 70 Muslims were also killed in the World Trade Center that day. Down at Ground Zero, construction has begun on what one day will be the Freedom Tower. Manhattan was once a difficult place to get onto. As a result, industry stayed in the outer boroughs. Much of that has gone. But I'm traveling to Queens, to a factory that was founded over 100 years ago by a German immigrant. The family became so vital to the local community that this entire neighborhood is named after them. They employ 450 people to make exactly the same thing that they first manufactured in 1853. Rough blocks of timber arrive at one end of the factory. Two years and 300 hands later, they've been transformed into a Steinway. But before each piano can pass out of the factory, it has to pass the ear of one man. He's been at Steinway 45 years, he's worked his way up from the factory floor, and Wally has become the most critical cog in the whole machine. So you've made one, two, three, four, five, six, up here. Quite a lot of little marks there, and I couldn't, I couldn't hear anything that was different <laughs> at all. So I take the keys out, right? I put the piece of wood on there to support the hammer. And then you take the needles, 
Mm. And we find a note that... Right. And sits on the top of the hammer, poked and on the hole. Watch my finger. <laughs> <laughs> that softens it up, does it? <laughs> Yeah. Softens it up a bit, and therefore softens the note, the the, the sound that's sound. coming out. Yeah. Make it more round. Right. This mm. piano is completely done, mm. and I just put the icing on it. Right. Excellent. Sound better yeah. to you? <laughs> it sounds fantastic to me. It sounded fantastic to me the first time I heard it. Did you learn to play the piano? <laughs> Four years ago. Four years ago? Yeah. I can't. Remember. You've been you've been making this this sound all this time, but you haven't been able to play the piano. No. Learning the piano is a big deal to me. Is it? And you t and you feel you are you going to be you could, you've got a piano handy to practice on yeah, at least. I play all day. <laughs> Not a bad job. <laughs> Not a bad job. And what what are we? I leave here. Piano was part of me. I put my feeling into it. My love. I love pianos. Most <laughs> <laughs> Immigrants from across the sea brought classical and folk music from Europe. The other great sound of this city arrived as part of the largest inland migration the world has ever seen. When the black people of the southern United States moved north and brought their music with them. James Allen has invented an inspired way of raising finance for a drug rehab center. He brought together a group of addicts to form a gospel choir here in Harlem. We think of gospel as being something that's in England associated with the southern states of, of America, but it, it's it's strong in New York as well. God is real in New York, not just strong, but real. So when somebody goes to church or gospel church, I've heard the phrase used, they have church. What does that mean, have church? That means that we get down, we give our emotions to God. It's not like you guys, you know, you guys keep your emotions out. You like to control them. But when you go to church, you learn to release your emotions and get all that tenseness out. If I'm going to uh, try and sing along with a choir, how, how good a singer do I have to be to sing gospel? Well, as long as you don't sing too loud, we would accept you even if you were singing a little off key. Okay, but so I can't do the audition here in the office? No, we, we do it in front of the choir during rehearsal time. Okay. That's it. You got to introduce yourself to the, to the choir. Okay. And uh, first you introduce yourself to them. All right, well, my name is Griff. Hi. Uh, hi. Hello, everybody. Uh, 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 amazing grace, how sweet yeah, 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 a yeah, tone. Uh, you are very blessed <laughs> to have a, a day job yes, like me. <laughs>
Taking my seat in the middle of that waterfall of voices was a profound experience for me. I could see how the discipline of James Allen's choir provided a backbone for the daily lives of these extraordinary singers. It's five to seven, and I have an appointment that I simply cannot be late for. At exactly this time every evening, an important ritual begins below the streets of New York. It may sound like a jungle canopy at dusk, but these are the voices of experience. It's 30 minutes to curtain up, and the Broadway cast of the hit musical comedy Xanadu is going through the same warm-up routine for the 402nd time. Oh, hey, Griff. Uh, hi, how are you? We're good. Uh, natural. That's one of the charming features of musical theater actors, because they'll be in the middle of a conversation. Oh, I saw the cutest dress today. Whee! <laughs> so it kind of like resembles a Tourette syndrome, but yeah, it's really not. Of. Can you time your whole half hour down, yes. down yeah, to the last much. second? Yeah, There's the pin really. curls first, which yeah. you put in the, yeah. which is kind of a pain in the ass. Mm -hmm. and, and then, then you do a little much. badinage. And then it fit, and then what it is fit, badinage? A little chat between the two of you, oh, and then wow. you carry on. I thought it was some hygienic cleansing. You're going to have to come with a glossary. Uh, I've been walking outside all day. i got to do a badinage. Okay. <laughs> and then at 15, we get dressed. And I like to be ready at 15. So then I just sit around and I usually solve the final puzzles on Wheel of Fortune. What, what, what about getting into character? Does that happen? Oh, oh you mean how do I mentally? How prepare? do you mentally put I'm them out of I'm not that good an actor. You might want to talk to somebody else. <laughs> you don't do. You don't go and sit on the stage, cross legged, and, 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 and get the and get the spirit no, of the no. theatre. No, no. We practice come to funny faces in the mirror, though. How, oh, dear right. God, no, and how long we does get, it? We get those expressions ready for the big comedy. <laughs> I'm going to get out of the way. I don't want to go up on the elevator. That's the worst thing. Last year, ticket sales on Broadway totaled $939 million. That means 33,000 bums settled onto 33,000 seats every night of the year. And when show business can't get into the theatre, it seems like it spills out onto the street. Walking past Pennsylvania Station, I fall into step with a herd of Indian elephants. It's the Barnum Circus leaving town. Elephants are simply too heavy to catch the commuter train, so they have to escort them off the island and out by the Midtown Tunnel. Just as suddenly as they came, they've gone. And somebody's going to go home tonight and say, Honey, I'm sorry I'm late, but there was an elephant crossing the street in front of me and... She's not going to believe him, is she? New York, a hell of a town. The Bronx is up and the battery's down. The people ride in a hole in the ground. New York, New York, it's a hell of a town. At the Museum of Natural History, it's long past closing time. But I've been given privileged access to the Hall of American Mammals to hunt down something extraordinary. I get a strange feeling that I'm not alone. That may be because just around the corner are 500 little girls in pajamas. What are you doing here? It's a sleepover for Girl Scouts. It's a sleepover for Girl Scouts? Yes. Do you think you're really going to get much sleeping done tonight? No. You're a party animals who stay up all night. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, no, I'm just okay. Oh, that's fine. Yeah, all right, that's good. Animals, that's good. Party okay. with the animals. Good night. Good night, ladies. Good night. The reason that I'm here tonight is not to see the North American mammals, or indeed, the North American Girl Scouts with their sleepover, but actually, to have a look at this. Because it's magnificent. It's a radiator. And those of you who are interested in central heating, and who isn't, might like to know that the Natural History Museum, like a lot of buildings in New York, doesn't actually have its own boiler. That's because it has access to this one. Central heating in New York really does mean central. 
This complex on the East River houses the most impressive array of pipework that I have ever encountered. And all this plumbing fantasy here goes to produce the steam in that pipe up there. Goes there. From this mega boiler, steam is pumped out to heat 100,000 homes and businesses. I'm inside New York's own cupboard under the stairs. And over here we have the furnace. So you see the fire in the boiler there. Steam is produced here 365 days a year, even through the hottest summer. The belly of the beast in there. The plant not only heats buildings, it's also used to power air conditioning units. Steam heat keeps 8.2 million New Yorkers cool. It's getting late now, but I'm hoping that here in Chinatown, I may still be able to find what I'm looking for. You come out, I could help you. Wow. Fantastic. So handsome. Thank you. <laughs> and the mirror. <laughs> really good. Good. Let me have a look at myself here. Yeah, yeah everything right. perfect. Everything perfect? Yes. All Just right. perfect. Besides Chinatown, New York has its Little Italy, its Spanish Harlem, Little India, Little Odessa. The neighborhoods where a single ethnic group predominates are so many, it's hard to keep track. It's been calculated that a third of New Yorkers were not actually born in New York. There are more Irish people living here than there are in Dublin, more Jews than Jerusalem, more Bayesians than there are in Barbados. In this multiracial city, I've no doubt my own ethnic group is well represented. But I get the feeling I'll be the only Epping Welshman where I'm going now. On any weekend through the year, more than a thousand weddings are taking place across New York. Yet curiously, here in the great melting pot, most marriages are still between couples who come from the same ethnic background. Allah and Zahn are Russian Jews. Sean would begin by placing the ring on Allah's finger. Repeat after me. Hare at Mikudesh Esli, Bitabas Zu, Kedas, Moshe, the Israel. Now, anybody that knows glass knows that when you break a piece of glass, you can never put that baby back together 100% again. So what we're doing today now is we're engaging in a bit of superstition. You'll excuse me. What we're saying is like this. If something has to break between these people that can't be put back together again, let it be this glass. Let's get it out of the way right now. Mazel. by Russian standards, a big wedding or about average? It's an average size, right. but is it a it's a typical one. Is it? Michael Smirnoff, like almost everyone here, has adopted this country. English is not his first language. Would you like to meet some people? Some yeah, would, yeah, come on, let's go and meet right. some people. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. So, uh, how's it going so far? So far, so good. <laughs> no, no disasters so far? Thank God. <laughs> Well, this is the mother of the bride. Many congratulations. This has been a great, a great, great celebration. Thank you for having us here. Thank you for coming. So now she's married. Yes. And she's out of your hands, you think? Yes. <laughs> I hope your beauty will be good. Right? right? What does your husband do? Uh, I don't have a husband. I'm divorced. Are you divorced? Yes. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
The celebration gets wilder and the vodka stronger. And as we travel further into the night, we get closer and closer to downtown Vladivostok. It's 3 a.m. and I'm crossing the city for one last appointment with someone who, in my experience, can't necessarily be relied on for their timekeeping. There's supposed to be one along every four and a half minutes. But at the Morgan Stanley Children's Hospital, this newest of New Yorkers is taking as long as he or she wants. Okay. Everything's okay? Yes. Everything went all right? Good. Thank you. Hello, hello. Hi. This is Juan Alexander and my wife, Muske. Enora Buena. Oh, wow. <laughs> yes. Well, he's ready for New York. Yes, yes. Born to Peruvian parents, Ivan is the first in his family to be a native New Yorker. That's the light coming up on what's going to be the little boy's first day in this fascinating place. I wouldn't like to guess what New York will be like as he grows up in it. But I expect, like millions of others, he'll find that change and continuous invention is part of the excitement of this remarkable city.